to, I'm going to give you two examples of how I think this has um, shown itself over the, the years. This is how you did multilingual in Drupal 3. These are the instructions that tell you what SQL queries to run and how to change your conf file. This is how you added a new language in Drupal 7. Right? Much, much better, but not possible in a closed system. Not possible without people who are dedicated to doing this kind of work because it's important to them. Um, the second one is this, um, there's one supported database in Drupal 3. It's all MySQL native code. Right? There is database abstraction, but it's only for security. Right? There's not the kind of database abstraction that we think of when we look at the way Drupal interoperates now with MySQL and, and uh, oh, what's that other one that people sometimes use? Uh, Postgres, yeah, Postgres. Uh, uh, lesson number six. This is, this is lesson number six. And, and the GPL is part of this. Removing barriers is good, right? It's very, very important. If you remove barriers to entry by opening up your system, you get more contributors, you get more ideas, you get more collaboration, right? You get all kinds of unexpected benefits. How many people in the room have had that eureka aha moment where you find the module that is so perfect that you would have had to write it if it didn't already exist? Mine was NodeQ, by the way, just like half the people here, right? NodeQ, the first module I ever would have written had it not been already there. It was actually released like a week before I needed it. It was awesome. Um, these are some new concepts that are floating around since Drupal 3. I showed you like YouTube was a new thing. These are just new web concepts, right? I'm not even talking Drupal concepts. jQuery, Ace, there's no JSON. It just didn't exist yet. Um, we didn't have WYSIWYG editors. People weren't thinking this way. Um, simple test, except PHP had no exception handling. Yeah, that comes in in four, I think. Maybe not until five, proper. Um, RDF, which was the big push in, in Drupal 7. Uh, PHP 5, uh, SEO, right? No one was talking about SEO. Google was pretty powerful, but not what they are now. No memcache cloud hosting. And this enterprise Drupal concept. I was actually one of the first enterprise Drupal adopters because I worked for, at the time, the the biggest company coming to these things. When I went to Vancouver, we sent a, a, an army of five people. There were 120 people total in Vancouver. Five of them were from us, from a newspaper company doing evaluation about whether or not Drupal was enterprise class. I had my Oracle administrator with me. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> this is the big one, and, and I was, again, uh, pleased and disappointed that Dries charted out this exact same slide this morning, right? But I wrote this three days ago. Um, this changes the entire landscape, but it wasn't even on the radar. In 2001, I remember um, one of our web content gurus being really excited because he was getting baseball scores to his phone. That's all he was getting were, were line scores. Like, oh, it's three to two in the bottom of the fourth inning. And he was thrilled. This is so ubiquitous now. It changes the way everything uh, everything comes up. These are some of the new Drupal concepts that we've come up with. And if you go to any of the core conversations, if you are a developer, they're, they're going to be fascinating all week. But these are things that didn't exist at all in Drupal 3 that have come up um, because people need them, right? Upgrade hooks. There, there's an upgrade text file in Drupal 3 and a folder with some SQL scripts. It's like, oh, if you're moving from one to two, or two to three, run this. Uh, there's no automated installer, there's none of that good stuff. Another <laughs> fascinating Matt Farina slide. There are no JavaScript files in Drupal 3. There are a few JavaScript actions in Drupal 3, um, but we have 84 JavaScript files in Drupal 7. Um, which, again, brings up this lesson number seven. You have to plan for change. If you're a core developer, if you're a module developer, even if you're an evaluator, you have to know that, as they say, the drop is always moving. And that's because life is always moving. It's just a fact. And, and Dries hit this point pretty well this morning, too. Um, I also point out, very one of the things that I'm actually very worried about is generational shifts leading to changes in user behavior that no one in this room would even comprehend. Right? I'm, I'm getting old, I'm 42 this year, right? I have no idea how Dimitri Gaskin interacts with Drupal, or with websites, or with information, right? I have a cousin, 
excuse me, I have a nephew who's like 13, same boat, right? He wanted, he was, he was actually looking for a project. He's like, uh, you know, I want to learn some programming. I want to learn some stuff. So I was going to show him how to do some web stuff. And he's like, eh. And then I showed him, like, his, he had his mother's uh, um, MacBook. I was like, well, I can show you how to write a widget. He's like, eh. Okay, we can get the iPhone developer's kit and I can show you how to say hello world and that'll be cool. Um, and he actually was, that got him excited. And then he started to trust me because the first lesson in the iPad developer's handbook is how to write a hello world statement. So he trusted I knew what I was talking about. Yeah, well, let's, we're going to write a hello world application. What? Uh, so um, these are some new Drupal modules that, that have come out since then. These are all the things in the Drupal 7 that were in Drupal 3. <laughs> Um, these are the database tables. Right? There were actually 38 tables in the three, which is a, a fair amount. Um, by my count, there were 78 in a baseline install of Drupal 7. Um, and there's a big cost to this. This is Dries' famous um, graph of Drupal skill. And I can remember, actually, when I got to the I kick ass threshold, which was like two and a half years ago, maybe. Um, um, the changes that we've made since Drupal 7, some of them are awesome and some of them are great, but wow, increased complexity and barriers for entry. Uh, and Dries had that great thing about it, the five gates to getting into Drupal 8, and that's going to be really painful for a lot of people. Simple test was really painful for me. It's a good thing, but this increased, the, the cost of innovation is increased complexity, and that's something we as a community are really going to have to deal with. Um, I also point out the bus factor. Everyone know what the bus factor is? The bus factor is the number of people who, if hit by a bus, will screw your project. Yeah. So in Drupal 3, if Dries gets hit by a bus, the 22-year-old Dries dies, Drupal dies with him. Right. The closest we ever came in Drupal to that, I think, was in Sunnyvale when I had a minivan, and I had Dries and Webchick and Chicks and Neil Drum, I think, all in my car at once, coming home from dinner on a dark night. We were actually joking about it. Dries didn't know what the bus factor was at the time. <laughs> it does now. Um, and you know what? Actually, I think it was Webchick or, or, or Chicks who said, well, if we all you know, die in this car, someone else is just going to have to step up. And that's an important part of the Drupal philosophy, too, I think. Um, I'll just go through these a little bit quickly. Total files are actually 254 files in Drupal. We're up to 1,100 files in Drupal 7, which is, yeah, I saw Barry wince. He physically winced. Um, code weight, right? You take every, this includes images and things too, um, but yeah, 1.2 meg, a download of Drupal 7 is 13.6 megs. Um, lines of code, this includes comments and other things. I actually grepped this on the command line. 11,000, almost 12,000 lines of code in Drupal 3, 291,000 lines of code in Drupal 7. Some of that is documentation. We're going to look at that in just a second. Uh, lesson number eight from all this is you have to plan for growth. You have to put systems and things in place, even for your own local development or your own local business. If you take on Drupal, you're going to have to watch these things. Plan for growth. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, and then that's what I want to talk about. So documentation. Yes, yeah, some of it is documentation. In fact, a lot of it is documentation. And that's because the community has responded to these challenges, right? Because Drupal, for all the new complexity we've come on, still makes people's jobs easier, right? I never have to write a damn user authentication system ever. And I don't want to. And I use Drupal, right? So these are some of the things that the community has put in place, right? These are basically community-driven initiatives. And Dries touched on some of these this morning as well, right? Um, documentation standards being a huge one. Um, this is actually a function count of Drupal 3 to Drupal 7, right? Ten times, no, no ten times? Yeah, ten times as many functions in 7 as in 3. This is the count of documented functions. <laughs> right? This is the actual chart that I came up with, and, and uh, Jennifer Hogden might dispute me, but by my count, 98% of all of Drupal 7 core is properly doc blocked. I mean, I, I follows our documentation today. 